So on behalf of the um, Ash Centre and our co-sponsors for today's event, which are two Kennedy School student groups, the HKS Progressive Caucus and the Harvard Journal for Hispanic uh, Policy, it's great to welcome you here today uh, for today's panel. The topic of today's discussion is immigrant rights and immigrant integration. Specifically, our focus will be on reforms and innovations aimed uh, at enhancing the inclusion and empowerment of immigrants in general and the undocumented in particular that take place at the local and state levels. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists to you uh, here today. Our three panelists come with a wealth of uh, experience and expertise working with and for immigrants uh, in a range of policy areas and uh, at various levels of government. First of all, let me introduce uh, uh, Kamal, Kamal Esaheb. Kamal is an Im immigration policy attorney with the National Immigration Law Center, uh, where he engages in advocacy and technical assistance relating to state and local enforcement of immigration law and access to legal status uh, for immigrants. Uh, Kamal's advocacy focuses on the passage of the DREAM Act, uh, implementation of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, and state and local enforcement of immigration law. Prior to joining the NI, LC, uh, Kamal was a practicing immigration attorney at CUNY Citizenship Now, a nonprofit profit immigra immigration legal services provider in New York City. Uh, Kamal is a graduate of Fordham Law School where he was a Stein uh, scholar in public uh, interest law and ethics. Um, our second panelist is Kika Matos. Uh, Kika is director um, of Immigrant Rights and Racial Justice at the Center for Community Change. Uh, formerly, Kika was deputy mayor in the city of New Haven. And it was in New Haven that she oversaw the creation of the groundbreaking Elm City Resident uh, Card Program, which is an ID card for all residents aimed at addressing public safety concerns among the immigrant uh, population and create opportunities to engage them in, in civic life. Uh, Kika has a BA from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, an MA from the New School and a JD from Cornell Law School. Uh, Kika is a recipient of numerous awards, including the 2005 John, uh, JFK New Frontier Award and New Haven's Registers Person of the Year Award. Um, our third and final panelist today is Carlos Cefedra. Uh, Carlos first became politically active when he joined um, other undocumented classmates in his high school here in East Boston to start a campaign to improve access to higher education. Uh, Carlos later became the national coordinator of the first national organization of undocumented youth, the United We Dream Network. And for this work in 2011, he was awarded the Activist of the Year Award by The Nation magazine. Carlos then joined the End Our Pain and Right to Dream campaigns that pressured President uh, Obama to grant relief to undocumented students on June 15th, 2012. Uh, one of the biggest victories in the past 26 years of the immigrant rights movement. Carlos is currently a consultant to immigrant rights organizations and is developing a training institute for social change. Um, we had also hoped to uh, welcome Pittsfield's representative, Tricia Farley Bouvier. Representative Farley Bouvier is the House sponsor of, the, of House Bill uh, 3285, which actually at this very moment is winding its way through Beacon Hill. Uh, dubbed the Safe Driving Bill, this new law would allow immigrants who don't qualify for a social security card to apply for a driver's license. Unfortunately, due to legislative duties, uh, the representative wasn't able to join us here this afternoon. So today's panel, believe it or not, is actually the last panel uh, of the year, of the academic year. And it seems doubly fitting that this, our last event, should, albeit by coincidence, take place on International Workers' Day. Uh, first in recent years, May 1st has become an important date for rallies and marches across the country in support of immigrant rights and immigrant um, inclusion. And so I'm pleased that in our small way here today, we are part of that conversation. The second reason that today's panel is fitting is that, uh, that, and that it should take place on May 1st is because of the fact that there's been an implicit or explicit seat at the table this year for workers uh, during our uh, event series, which was about challenges to democracy. So as many of you know, the focus of our programming in this past year in honor of the center's 10th anniversary has been on examining challenges to democracy in different parts of the world, but in particular here in the United States. And a theme that we've come back to time and time again is a simple one, that uh, socioeconomic and political inequality is high and increasing in the United States, uh, and that, that has uh, massive ramifications inequality between the rich and the poor and between uh, 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 capital and labor. And as economist uh, Thomas Piketty has been arguing, uh, this results from uh, returns on capital rather than returns on labor. And so it's appropriate that today we should also have our last event 
um, on the workers' day. So without further ado, I'll be handing it over just for some introductory remarks by our panelists about the type of work they do, their background, the impact their work has had, and then we'll have a little back and forth of questions and we'll open it to questions from the floor. Thanks. So Kamal, would you like to begin? Sure, uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Kamala Saheb. I am immigration policy attorney at the National Immigration Law Center. Um, and I was asked to, I guess, uh, in my opening remarks, talk about um, two things, basically. One, how I got into this work. And two, uh, you know, what is this work that, that I'm engaged in? Um, like, like a lot of folks in the immigrant rights movement, I think um, my, my journey to this work was personal. Uh, I, uh, I wasn't born here. I was born in Morocco. I came here as a kid, and I grew up undocumented. And uh, for a, you know a, quite a few years, for over a decade, my being undocumented, I grew up in New York, by the way, um, my being undocumented didn't really make a difference in my life. Right? I was able to do things that my classmates were able to do. You know, I was able to go to school. I was able to uh, basically just live a normal life. I uh, didn't know that there was a difference between me and my neighbors, my classmates. I knew I wasn't born here, but I didn't think that mattered, right? That, that, that didn't really have any effects um, for me. And you can't really drive in New York anyway, so my inability to get a driver's license wasn't even on my radar. Um, and then 9-11 happened. Uh, after 9-11, we've seen uh, just uh, really a dramatic change in how immigrants are treated and dramatic change in how people from certain countries, right, predominantly Arab Muslim countries, were, were treated by the immigration system. And uh, case in point was the special registration program, uh, which uh, we'll talk about in some detail. It was uh, an initiative of, I forget it was then the Department of Homeland Security or INS, but it was an initiative of the federal government to basically identify people from uh, 24 predominantly Arab Muslim countries and, uh, and take enforcement actions against them. It was sort of advertised as this sort of way to find terrorists, uh, you know, millions of dollars in and tens of thousands of people deported later. Not a single terrorist was identified through the program, but that, 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 that was the idea. So I, I remember hearing things about this, and I think I was a junior in, in college, and, uh, and then thinking, something, you know, what is this thing? Does this apply to me? Does this apply to my family? Uh, what is this registration requirement? What do, we, what do we have to do? So I remember doing some Google searching. I, I guess then it wasn't really Google searching. It was an AOL search. And, uh, and, then, and then seeing all sorts of confusion on message boards and, uh, and, and, you know, reporting that had contradictory information. And then ultimately I landed on the federal <laughs> register notice and after spending like 20 hours trying to parse through it, it was clear to me that, that hey, this is something that applies to me and the male members of my family, my dad and my, my younger twin brothers. And so we, we went in and registered. Registration entailed going to the, to the sort of federal immigration facility in New York, where I remember it was, I forget it was December or January. It was, it was a cold winter day and there were, you know, literally like hundreds of, brown men waiting to go into the federal building to register. And there was fear on their face, there was confusion, it wasn't clear, you know, nobody knew what was happening. All, all we knew was that we were going to, you know, present ourselves to the government authorities and then something would happen. And then once we went inside, we were in a room, probably a little bigger than this, and, you know, over 100 men are there, and they're sort of just interviewed one at a time. Um, and the interviewing was, you know, to me as a college student who was not politicized and, you know, was sort of agnostic to, uh, to, to politics to, to, uh, and just thought the world made sense, it was, it was probably the most memorable day in my life. Uh, I was, you know, having a mugshot taken of you, being fingerprinted, being asked how many times a day you pray if you're a terrorist, if you know anybody who's a terrorist, ask to, for your wallet to be opened up in front of an officer. Seen my dad get yelled at because he asked to go to the bathroom, and you know, seen him get yelled at, you know, by a man in, with a gun. Um, it really made me feel like I 
somehow needed to do something about it. So it, to me, that was sort of the beginning of my politicization and, and the beginning of, of, of my interest uh, in getting into this work. And somehow I cobbled my way through law school and, uh, and you know, I'm fortunate enough to be uh, a here because I was put in removal proceedings when that happened. They identified the fact that I was here without immigration status. So fortunate to be here and fortunate enough to be uh, doing this work. So the work, the work that I'm doing is, um, well, I'll tell you a little bit of, um, about my organization. We, uh, uh, the National Immigration Law Center is a national organization that um, works on a host of issues related to low income immigrants. Um, and uh, you know these issues sort of relate to access to health, access to benefits, uh, workplace protections, uh, and and protections from um, immigration enforcement that's uh, inconsistent with 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 our values. And we do that through I guess we think of our work as as happening at least three dimensions, right? One is the issues, right? We work on a, the, the list of issues that I that I just talked about. One is uh, I guess sort of the forum where it happens, right? State level, federal level, uh, even you know, more local level. And then strategies. We, we engage in um, policy advocacy, uh, in litigation, and we also provide technical assistance to, to legislators both federally and uh, at the state and local level. So um, I'm probably over time, but I'll, I'm, I'm happy to dig into some of these uh, details on, on, on the work that we do as the, as the conversation moves forward. Can you guys hear me okay? More for the audio recording. So my story is nowhere near as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, my journey into the immigration world began in 2001. I am what I call a recovering lawyer. I, for 11 years, I did criminal justice work and um, I represented death row inmates in state post-conviction and federal habeas proceedings. And one of the things that my colleagues and I would do after one of our clients was executed w was to sit and talk about what we would be doing if we weren't representing people on death row. And I would always say I, wanna, I would want to be doing something community-based. I would want to do preemptive work. I would want to do something that would prevent people from leading such terrible lives. And, um, and, but it was one of those things that you fantasize about. You know, it was a way of processing executions and getting through the trauma of having lost a client. Um, but then I fell in love and uh, started the back and forth with my now husband about who was going to do the move. I was living in Philadelphia at the time. He was living in New Haven. And I'd like to say I lost the battle but won the war. I agreed to move to New Haven only under the condition that he would make the move for me the next time around. So I moved to New Haven. Now, when I was in Philadelphia, I was representing 14 people on death row. When I moved to Connecticut, I realized I started looking um, for a way to get steeped into death penalty work, and their death row was small. N now Connecticut doesn't have a death penalty, but at the time there were only five people on death row, and all of them were very ably represented. And so I realized that unless I moved somewhere else or started working in New York City, that my career as a death row lawyer would be over. And so that's when I realized that it was time to put my money where my mouth was and start looking to do community-based work. And I came across this organization called Junta for Progressive Action in New Haven that for a long time focused on providing um, services to Latinos. It was originally founded to address the needs of Puerto Rican migrants. Um, but over time, as the population in this one particular neighborhood that has historically been a neighborhood of, of immigrants called Fairhaven, as the population changed, so did the needs of um, the immigrants. And so while Fairhaven still had a majority Latino uh, immigrant population, over time it changed from being predominantly Puerto Rican to predominantly people from Latin and South America, many of whom, and Central America, uh, Central America many of whom had no immigration status. And so I headed up this organization for a couple of years, and it was originally a social services organization, and over the five years that I was there, I worked to transform it into an organization that did advocacy, especially around uh, immigration. So we did uh, public policy work, and we really advocated for changes in the city of New Haven, 
um, because at the time, New Haven, like many other cities, did not have a plan for integrating undocumented immigrants. Uh, immigrants were living in the sh proverbial shadows uh, with government paying no attention to them. So I worked at Junta for five years and then was recruited by the mayor of New Haven to be um, his deputy. And one of the things that we'd been working on at the community level, we, we uh, worked with faith-based organizations, uh, legal clinics, community-based organizations, and immigrants. And we came up with a list of public policy initiatives that we wanted the city of New Haven to implement to change the conditions for undocumented immigrants. And the most controversial one was this resident ID card. So when the mayor asked me to work um, uh, for him, I said that I would do it, but only under the condition that I be allowed to roll out this ID card and that I be allowed to do immigration work in New Haven. So I did that. We did the, uh, all of the policy initiatives that we developed were uh, uh, implemented over time. The most difficult and controversial was the ID card one. Um, but then after a couple of years, um, I was asked by the executive director of the Center for Community Change to come uh, and lead the immigrant rights work in Washington, D.C. And so now my efforts really focus on trying to advance uh, comprehensive immigration reform at the um, national level. Uh, and I was just uh, saying that yesterday I, I uh, participated in an act of civil disobedience with seven young people ages 11 to 17. So I spent um, a few hours in jail, and I'm glad to be out. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Carlos. Yes, thanks so much. Um, thank you, Kika. Thank you, Kamal. Um, okay, so my name is Carlos Saavedra. I am from East Boston, Massachusetts. So I'm from here. Uh, and I don't know. I don't even know my story anymore. But I came to the U.S. when I was 12 years old. I'm originally from Lima, Peru, came with my mother, my father. And my young brother was four years old. And I guess because we're talking about in-state tuition laws and all this, uh, state immigrant laws, I'll tell more about that story. But actually, I went to high school here, and I started in seventh grade. And when I was maybe in ninth or tenth grade, uh, one of our teachers said to the students that he, well, he, has, he was a history teacher. He said, if you'll come to this set of meetings about, you know, kind of like this group that was talking about immigration, will give you an A automatically on the class. I wasn't part of the class, sadly, because an A will become very good at me, you know, at that time in my life. But as you can imagine, he had the first meeting and all the students were there, you know, even the ones that really didn't even care for school were there, you know? So he had this set of meetings and, uh, you know, I came with a visa but six months later I was undocumented in this country and I had been undocumented most of my life in this country. I recently got my documents a couple of years ago. and. They had these meetings, and nobody really talked about being undocumented in our school. Even between young people, we always kind of always said things to figure out, like, oh, no, I'm in the process. I'm going to talk to a lawyer, right? right Kamal, all, all the things we say to, like, uh, not say that we're undocumented because probably half of us don't even know what the heck that means. So he starts having the meetings. People start talking about it, and they're talking about it, and people are crying about it, and then they realize that, wait, the big crying has to do that there's no way we could go to college because they're going to charge us three times the tuition. And I think that time here in UMass was like eighteen to $22,000. I mean, and we couldn't apply for financial aid, you know, loans, all the nine yards. So we're just thinking, well, what's the whole point of this thing, right? Because we, some of us, I, I remember when I was 13, no, 14, I talked to my parents literally on a Sunday afternoon and I said to my mom, I made a plan to her and I said to her mom, I'm going to quit high school so I can go work and I'm just going to come back in 12th grade because might as well come back in 12 because there's no point for this thing, right? We just might as well do work because we were struggling financially. So the students realized this and they said, we're going to do a campaign and the local coalition mayor here supported them. They did the campaign and they did this big event and they did event, they told stories, but back then people wouldn't come out as undocumented yet. They would just tell a story and if you weren't documented, you will kind of see the code language, if you know what I mean. So I went to the event and I saw this code language and I heard one of my friends, Monica, tell her story and she tells her story, she's crying and I don't have the time, like, I don't understand why she's crying because I wouldn't get the whole code. So I went to talk to her later and say, hey, Monica, what's, what's going on? Like, why can't you go to school? And she says, well, girls, because I don't have papers. You know, she's really sad, you know. To me, I just took it, my way to coping it is I just made a joke about it throughout high school. That's the way that I dealt with that huge uncertainty of not having papers, you know. Uh, people deal with different ways, you know. So I said, Monica, oh, my God, I didn't know you had papers because I don't have papers either. To me, it was the most exciting thing. 
to find somebody that didn't have papers because nobody talked to me about it, not even my parents. So Monica tells me, yeah, and I said, Monica, well, who else is undocumented here? I says, well, him, her, her. People start pointing out like 50 people in the crowd. I'm like, oh, my God. Well, most of us here are undocumented. So she said, yeah, we want to push for in-state tuition. So she educated me on it, and I joined the team. For three years throughout high school, every time after school, we went to meetings. We visited 60 high schools in about three years. We met with every legislator in Massachusetts. We cried to every legislator, you know. I used to f look for the careers of the legislators because they always ask us, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I will tell them their career, you know. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be, be a journalist, you know, and all that stuff, you know. Um, that was my kind of deal. And, you know, and then I graduated high school, and miraculously, we passed in-state tuition on the House of Representatives through the budget process and in the Senate with a unanimous vote. So I'm graduating high school, and I don't know about you when you were teenagers, but after passing that, I was a little cocky. I was a little, like, very proud. So I graduated. We're going to pass this law, you know, and, and we're undocumented and whatever. And we didn't even, you know, which to me was just a mind trip to be undocumented at passing laws at that age. So I go, and my mom, three days later, opens the Boston Globe, and in one side of the newspaper is the face of Mitt Romney. You know, his face is this size. His teeth are about this size. And literally, Mitt Romney had vetoed the legislation. And in the other side of the newspaper, still my friends and, and myself saying how we're going to beat up Romney. I think all these things we said on frustration. And we all got depressed. And uh, we all got depressed. And then the, the campaign fell apart. The organization became very weak. Uh, there's a whole other story about me and Kamal meeting in 2005. And we'll, we'll leave that for the later stuff. Uh, but we stopped that, and, and I went to work for a restaurant here in Boston uh, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, to 1 a.m. for a while. And I don't even remember even getting out of work for a while. And my father was a soccer player in Peru. And every time I would ask him about any sort of, I don't know how you say consejo in English, uh, advice? There you go, still ESL here. Any time I would ask him for advice, he would tell me a soccer story about faith, about love, anything had to do with a soccer a scenario. And I will get confused half of the time. You understand this because I want some deep advice and my dad is telling soccer stories. So I asked my dad, dad, I really miss the campaign because I really miss the community because I felt so lonely in work, you know? And my dad tells me, well, let me tell you a story. And I'm just like, oh no, he's gonna go again. <laughs> so he tells me, look, Carlos, you gotta understand this one thing about soccer. I was like, oh yeah. Tell me more, Dad, because he was a big soccer player. I said, he says, look, Carlos, there's a difference between playing a game and playing for a team. And I'm just like, Dad, I still do not get you. He said, no, hold on. This is going to make sense. And he says, look, when you had a campaign, you had a great game. People come together because they want to win the game. So what happens when you win? Everybody claps it out and good. But when you lose, people leave. He said, if you have a team, a.k.a. an organization, he said, even if you lose, you can get stronger. And I was like, what? First time my dad blew my mind in that way, you know? <laughs> so a couple of my peers and myself built an organization here in Massachusetts called the Student Immigrant Movement. We're about to turn nine years old this November. And organization primarily led by undocumented young people. Uh, and we always had a vision of building an institution. That's why we were never called the Dream Act Group or anything like that. We were called the Student Immigrant Movement. And um, I will end with two points. Um, the, the, the second one is that we went back, and the way we founded this organization is we brought 400 students to the State House in 2005 uh, in a big action to demonstrate that we wanted in state tuition. Three months later, uh, the governor, the people that were running for governor, uh, O'Reilly and Kerry Healy at that time, went to um, what is it, talk radio, and they were battling our, our issue. And Riley came very supportive, and then he was telling her, how dare you? And she said, you know, just let them go to private schools. That was her thing, right? And then the Democratic Party organized, somebody dressed as Marie Antoinette and brought her a big cake. So we were in all this media and all this momentum happening throughout this campaign, and I was like, oh my God, we pushed for a vote again, and we lost the vote. And um, now, but we lost and we got stronger. And then we said, we're going to push again. And then Deval Patrick won the election on a promise on in-state tuition uh, for undocumented young people. So this is what I will say. Uh, after that, I, 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 uh, I finished my term here. I went and worked with the National United with Dream Network. We built teams all across the country. And we push, 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 both the legislature, both the president. We got something called the Fred Action. And my brother qualifies for that. He's in his second year in Clark University here in Massachusetts. Uh, he's already 19, about to be 20 years old. Um, 
And what I would say around this is like, I am interested in the fight where immigrants can have some agency on their lives. Because most of the times we're treating like we're victims, but we have nothing of being victims. It's the opposite. You know, somebody who crossed a border with a whole family, my dad immigrated when he was 40. And so I don't know if I'm willing to do that stuff at 40, like my dad did. Uh, but that's what I'm interested in. I also had the privilege to go to Europe uh, this year and last year and work with other migrant groups in the UK, in Sweden, in Spain, and really seeing that there's a lot of similarities. Like, for example, the, and I'll end with this, the owners of the jails, the private prisons here are the same owners in the UK, the same owners in Australia, the same company. The same policies are being replicated across the world. So I am finding myself in the challenge that we need an international migrant rights movement to really be effective, if anything, we're gonna, in the next century. So that's Great. it. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. The, the, is that still, yeah. The first question I have is about the local level, and though we end it with the global. Uh, so maybe we can like figure out a way how they're all articulated and connected and what way they might be connected. So the, the three of you have sort of operated at different levels and worked at different levels. But in the last few years, because of sort of what's going on at the federal level, there seems to be a renaissance at the local level. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent it, it really is a renaissance or whether there actually was a lot of work being done at, always at the local level and it's just uh, more light is being shone on it now and whether the local really is a second best option or is something more than that and just has been un recognized for quite a while because the focus has been on the federal level. Um, so Kika, maybe we could start with you. Uh, what do you think is so important about the local and what's its promise and potential? Sure. I, what I, uh, when I worked in New Haven doing immigration work, one of the things I said to people is that um, we are, our um, immigrant brothers and sisters are our neighbors, right? Their kids go to school with our kids. Um, many immigrants, they change your sheets, they serve your food, uh, they do the work that um, other immigrants did um, in previous generations, and that continues. And so problems that immigrants face are our problems, and there are challenges. And when an immigrant gets murdered in the streets of New Haven, we don't get to call the federal government and say, this is your problem, solve it. It's our problem. And so I believe strongly that uh, it's really important for local communities to be very active and to create communities and environments that allow immigrants to thrive and to prosper. Um, you know, your question about whether, th whether um, there's been a growth in local initiatives or not, I think what I, it, it's a very difficult question to answer because I didn't do the qualitative research to be able to answer that adequately. But I will say this, um, I'll make two observations. One is we really have an immigrant rights movement now and it's growing every day and it's growing in parts of the country, including the South where previously um, there was very little advocacy around immigration issues. Um, and the force of the movement is now being felt all over the country, both at the federal level and at the local level. Um, but then the other thing I would say is that over time, um, because in, in part because of the movement and advocacy efforts at the local level, we have seen a lot of changes in the way that immigration has been articulated and advanced. So for a long time, what we saw was a lot of um, instances of anti-immigrant laws being passed, like in Alabama and in Arizona. And the immigrant rights movement a lot of time had to focus its efforts on fighting bad laws uh, and confronting people like Sheriff Arpaia. Um, and now what you're seeing is more successful efforts like the ones that Carlos explained where people over time um, have really honed their skills around advocacy and really advanced the pro-immigration agenda. So you've seen more and more states pass in-state tuition bills. You're seeing more and more states pass bills allowing for immigrants to have driver's licenses. More states have immigrant ID uh, cards and more efforts are really being made at the local level to advance a pro-immigration agenda. And I have no idea, and I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna engage in profanities because I don't know anybody in this room, but I don't have, I have no idea when these people in Congress are gonna get it together to advance immigration. I think it's a disgrace 
that we're still uh, fighting for comprehensive immigration le legislation. I think it's a battle worth having. But in the meantime, we can't wait for them to get it together. We really have, I think, an obligation to engage in local level work at the municipal level and at the state level. Sure. Um, so I, I actually think we're in a really exciting moment. Uh, the pendulum is swinging really heavily in the direction of, of, of pro-immigrant initiatives, and that hasn't always been the case. So four, month, four years ago last week, uh, Governor Jan Brewer in Arizona uh, signed into law uh, SB 1070, Arizona's anti-immigrant law that was really about the exact opposite of integration. It was about expelling as many people as possible as many undocumented immigrants as possible from the borders of the state of Arizona. Uh, just a couple of things that the law did. It required local police to check papers uh, of individuals they suspect to be undocumented. It created uh, criminal provisions, right? These are you know, provisions that were written into the Arizona code that criminalized harboring of individuals who are undocumented. Now, what does harboring mean? Well, it, it could include driving your mom, your undocumented mother to the grocery store if uh, even if you're a U.S. citizen, um, and criminal, you know, and, and tons of other provisions criminalizing, you know, uh, uh, the seeking of work by undocumented day laborers and and and, and so on. Um, once Arizona did that, uh, five states uh, more or less immediately followed suit: Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, Utah, Indiana. Uh, and it really looked like this is 2010, 2011, that this was going to be the national trend. Um, now, all these laws have been litigated. My organization is one of the uh, organizations that are fighting these laws. And, and for the most part, they've, uh, they've, most of these provisions have been blocked. Um, there was a case that went up to the Supreme Court in 2012, and all the other cases are in various stages of litigation. Um, but then in 2012, uh, actually probably starting around uh, after the election, November 2012 election, we started seeing a bit of a sea change. You know, all the hard organizing work that, that people like Carlos have been doing, you know, that the student immigrant movement are doing, and all around the country, all that hard organizing work in immigrant communities was really given a lift by what happened in the election. Uh, what happened in the election and by the president's DACA announcement in June of 2012. I think what happened, part of what happened, I mean, I think it's a much more complicated story, but part of what happened is the immigrant rights community felt a win, right, when DACA was announced. And when President Obama was elected with a 40-point win among Latinos and over a 40-point win among uh, Asian Americans, people felt like you know, immigration reform was inevitable, that, this is, that demographics were destiny, and that if any party is going to compete on a national scale, it had to address the concerns of, 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 of immigrants. And we, we haven't seen the consequences play out in Congress, right? We've, we, we, we've seen, we saw a comprehensive bill uh, that includes a path to citizenship uh, pass the Senate. We haven't seen that, uh, you know, get through to the, from, you know, we haven't seen the, the same from the people in, 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 in the House. But, but we've seen the consequences uh, felt at state legislatures and, uh, you know, and, and, and local governments around the country. We've, we've, we've seen um, driver's license bills, you know, bills allowing undocumented individuals to, to get driver's licenses in uh, multiple states this year, this year or last year. We saw uh, tuition, tuition equity bills pass in various states. We've seen, uh, and this last piece is the one that surprises me the most, we've seen various measures at the state and local <clears throat> level around the country uh, limiting the interaction of local government, local police, uh, and ICE, right? These are police chiefs, these are sheriffs, these are uh, state legislatures saying, we will not cooperate with ICE's separating of families, with Department of Homeland Security separating families in our state. We will not hand over that individual who just finished a sentence in our jails. We're not going to hand that person over to ICE. So uh, we are really in the middle of a really exciting pendulum swing uh, you know, with some of these policies. Now, why is that happening? I think part of it is politics, and I touched on that. I think another part is it's just straight up good policy. I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is the, the, the policy case for some of these things, you know, the, the public safety reason 
the, the public safety rationale for, for, for having people who are undocumented have driver's licenses, the, 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 the return on investment uh, for having uh, you know, a tuition equity law, the, the, you know, the, the, the building public trust between police and immigrant communities uh, that, that, that stems from some of these, um, some of these uh, policies that limit the interaction of the federal enforcement machine and, 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 and local police. All these you know, good policy arguments um, I, you know, I, I think are part of, part of what's happening too. So I think it's good policy, it's good politics, and it's, the, you know, it's, it's, it's also the moment created by the deferred action announcement by the president and the November 2012 election. Carlos, you were saying that the, like if the ultimate target or a, growing, uh, and a target of growing importance is the international, and then it's understood to the federal as well, but the, your origins in a way are in the local and a strong organizing movement theoretically should have local roots. What, what, what do you see as the place of the local or even the promise of the local in that sort of bigger movement if the target is something larger than that? Or is it that there's a change afoot? Uh, okay. Does this work? Okay, good. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think when people uh, mistake uh, when we say national, international, or or by planet, or you know, if we want to do coordination among planets too, it's that we think that things happen in some isolated, centralized office like Washington D.C., and then everybody else is like little things around the country that get moved. And I actually think that when I say this stuff, it's more to have a framework that is larger, but it's everything is local, everything is decentralized as much as we can. And uh, what I would, sh so that's my, my understanding of that, is just to see it larger, but we still have to figure out how it fits in Massachusetts or even in Boston. Uh, what I would add here to the points is that I think we're seeing, so I would say there's actually a specific reasons, I believe, why there's a state policy shift across the country, uh, both in the positive and the negative. And that has to do with the way the movement has changed over the last 10 years. One example, 2006, large, the largest demonstrations in US history, right? So much big that we were able to stop the most anti-immigrant law from passing Congress, even though it already passed the House, prevented from passing the Senate, actually passed legislation on the Senate side, right? Millions of people march to the street to take over, but of course, the movement polarizes so much on our side that then polarizes the other side too, right? 2007, Minutemen minute emerges. A lot of uh, raids in factories happen. Bush starts doing a lot of raids in factories. A lot of anti-immigrant laws start emerging as well, correct? 2008, what happened? Same thing, through the Obama of, of, of campaign, many Latinos mobilize, huge amounts, right? Great, then another challenge from the right. The Tea Party, uh, John Brewer, all these people start making throughout the, the, the 2009, 2010, all the anti-immigrant laws they wanted to. and. What I actually think, for example, and I'll tell a specific example in the context of the Dream Act. And today, uh, uh, I was hearing that the, in Florida, there was in state tuition just passed. I don't know if it, one chamber passed the whole thing. The whole thing. Okay. It passed the Senate today. Great. In state tuition uh, for undocumented young people in Florida passed today. And I'll tell you this little thing because this might be useful. So I was in a conversation with them about a couple weeks ago but with one leader in Florida, and they're saying, "Dude, we gotta push in state tuition in Florida." Okay. Why is it that there's in-state tuition in Florida and there's no in-state tuition in Massachusetts by law? Why is it if we're so progressive? It's because here, politically, we do not matter for the political parties. I think it's important to recognize that. In Florida, they matter a lot because they're a swing state. They're about to have midterm elections. They have to have the presidential. They got to give something to those immigrants, if you know what I mean. So there's a reason why they have this political opportunity. Now. Why is it that the, stack, the structure wants to do in-state tuition and not driver's license in Florida? That's my question. Because actually, driver's license af will affect our community more deeply than in-state tuition. Because the fear of driving and you being taken away is so much harder than if you cannot go to school. A if you know what I mean, right? Even in a household family, you would say, no, I prefer my parents to be with me than me to go to college. Any day. Why? It's because what, the, what social movements have done and what the dream movement has done has made to shift public opinion. That's, I think, to us, a key part of understanding how social movements bring about change in this country, is that first we have to change public opinion and then you can get the instrumental 
changes like policy. So for example, 2011, no, 2010, we, 2010, Wisco no, 2009, Wisconsin passes institution for undocumented young students. 2011, they lose. So they get it and they take it away. How does that work? And then the next years, from 2011, another maybe five to, how many states have passed institutions since 2011? How many, come on, maybe nine more? A lot this year. Right? It's, it's tons. Why? It's because public opinion changed on the DREAM Act nationally, and that was easier to polarize uh, the local legislatures around that. Of course, there's a, a number of capacity of how much, what's your state coalition look like and all the good stuff, and what, what does the dynamics locally. But to me, my claim is that the reason why we haven't won immigration reform in the country is because we have not won public opinion yet on immigrants in this country. There's public opinion around if people support immigration reform, which for a lot of people means a lot of different things, let me tell you. But we have not won that yet. We have not won the battle yet. And we need to figure it out. And I think if that's, to me, that's the part of where the national and the local come together. Look, the local needs the national. Because if we change the climate across the country, imagine that if we can change the way every American, or not every American, but at least the majority of Americans feel about immigrants, then things will really dramatically change. That's what I'm really, 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 really thinking is key. And that's what has happened here in Massachusetts. Here in Massachusetts, we've been slacking and organizing for the last five years. Most of the organizers left, and you know we haven't been able to pass any pro-immigrant laws. We don't have driver's license. We don't have anything against eyes. I mean, it's just, sorry, it's pathetic, and this is my state, so I take responsibility from it. But why? But at the same time, why is it that Massachusetts has such a great climate? Why is it that the governor enforced institution after the first action happened? It's because we want pu public opinion. So to me, those are some of the key patterns that I think we need to see around how do we develop strong organization, but how do we really think movement across the country? So that's it. Great. Well, so what's fascinating about that is you've got, you're targeting elites, whether to the local level or state level, the federal level, and trying to shift policy that way. And the other is a strategy of changing hearts and minds of people on the ground. And is that where the local dimension comes in? Is that the local is where you have opinion transformation and neighborhoods and communities transforming themselves? And then after the fact comes policy, or policy might come before, but it may then be retracted if the groundwork hasn't been done. Is that, do, you, do you see, when, when you're thinking about local work, is it as much, I mean, part of the local work seems to be about getting goods and services and inclusion and empowerment for certain groups, immigrant groups, the undocumented, and that's not necessarily a community-wide transformative story. And a transformative story would be embedding that in the what is that sort of work going on and how effect and has that has, has that changed over time, the broader changing hearts and minds at the local level through local activism? I can go first and then I'll give my mic and one talk for a while. <laughs> What I would say is that leadership development and organization has a lot to do with this. 2006 produced huge amounts of leaders, right Kamal? A lot of people get active. A lot of people say I wanna develop organizations. I see some heads nodding, of course. 2010, SB 70 produces a lot of leaders. So I would say that in the last five years, we have really increased the capacity of decentralized immigrant organization across the country. United We Dream emerges, other Dreamer Networks emerges. The domestic workers get really strong. The national day laborers organizing network gets really strong. So I think that we have to think about who are the people driving these local fights. Uh, those are local leaders that most of the times are volunteers. That what happens is they go into these big moments in 2010 and 2006. They see that something is possible. That's very important. Confidence is very important. But then they say, we're going to do local organization here and do something more about it. And what happens is that because there's these networks, they see, well, why can't we do what California is doing? Which is the thing that people in Arizona ask themselves all the time. Or here in Massachusetts, we always ask, why can't we do the thing that New York does, right? Even though we don't like them too much. I mean, it's cool. But why is it that we cannot do it? Why is it that they had in state? When did you pass institution? 2004? About that, yeah. Why they and why not us? But that is the challenge I think the leaders po pose on themselves to do more organizing, which I think if we increase organizational capacity, we can win in, in no time. So I mean, in, in, when I think about the relationship between you know developments at the local level and developments at the federal level, I mean, part of it is the same wave, right? I mean, I think we are seeing a wave of, you know, maybe we haven't changed 
public opinion yet on 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 immigrant you know total immigrant inclusion right giving a pat citizenship to all immigrants who are here undocumented we haven't won that fight yet but we are it, it is a changing sentiment i mean poll after poll does show that and and i i do think that 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 that's a wave that that at least theoretically should be felt both by federal policymakers and local policymakers i think unfortunately what we had in 2010 is a pretty severe redistricting after the census of some, you know, uh, in, in some states. And what that's done is it's made, um, you know, House Republicans, you know, insensitive to, 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 to some of these, to, to, to this wave, right? It doesn't really matter to them because their population was drawn and, you know, their district was drawn in a way that, you know, the immigrant proportion uh, uh, of their population is really small. Um, and I think we've seen sort of the effect of that play out. We, we had a, a pretty robust conversation in the Senate about immigration reform. Uh, we had a bill, uh, you know, and some people like it and some people don't, but it's better than any bill that's, uh, that, that's, that, that's uh, any comprehensive bill that's passed. Um, but the conversation ended in the House, which is run by House Republicans, many of whom are really immune from from the effects of you know organizing, and the effects of public opinion as it relates to immigrant issues, um, you know that's that you know that that that's been shifting. Um, so I think that's 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 part of what's happening here. Thank you. I um, I think your question is is to me akin to which comes first, the chicken or the egg, and I'm trying to figure out how to answer it in a way. That uh, so that I don't come across like a dog chasing its tail. So I will make f <laughs> an observation and say there are five things that I would point to um, in terms of changing conditions that we are now confronting for the better. One is political power. Uh, and I think Carlos mentioned it. Look, it's no surprise that um, uh, there is more attention paid by Congress to uh, issues of immigration Frankly, the reason is because of the 2012 elections, right? Where right after 71% of Latinos voted for Obama, 84% of Asian Americans voted for Obama, and the immigrant rights movement, I think, was smart enough writ large to exercise its political muscle after the elections and claim that victory. Um, and now, um, because of the changing demographics of the country, which I think is a second factor, both parties are realizing that they do need to pay attention to immigration issues. In particular, I think there's a civil war going on within the Republican Party between um, uh, elected officials who, who are only worried about their own elections and because of gerrymandering really don't care about um, immigration issues, right? But then the, the, the other side of the civil war is Republican leaders who realize that if they don't get right with immigration, they're gonna quickly become an extinct party. And by the way, there's a 2016 elections coming up. The other thing I would say is that immigrant families are becoming more empowered. And one of the observations that I make um, of this movement is, and one of the things that we focus on where I work, is really elevating the voices of people most affected. For a long time, the immigration movement was um, led by talking heads. Uh, many people who were not themselves immigrants, who did not have the immigrant experience and were DC-based and really had no clue about the lives of the people most affected. Uh, and that has changed over time. It's changed because of Kamal's work, it's changed because of Carlos's work, it's changed because people in their communities have stepped up and said, this is my issue, and so I'm gonna have a sense of agency over, over change. Um, and then the last thing I would say is there is a growing acceptance of immigrants, and I think it really depends on what community you're looking at to figure out what came to first, the chicken or the egg. So I think about my experience in New Haven, and when we moved forward with our initiative at the time that at the time was really radical, I faced death threats. There was just tremendous amounts of anti-immigrant hostility coming from outside of New Haven, uh, and threats that New Haven was going to be overrun by uh, undocumented immigrants, and that was going to be the end of the city. And through really hard work and advocacy, people accepted the changes and embraced immigrants. And now, you know, I think about it in state tuition passed, the driver's license bill passed. 2014 looks very different from 2007. 
Uh, and now there is a growing acceptance of, of immigrants. And the last thing I would say is that I, I, do, th I do note, um, I do think that immigration, the, part of the reason why we still don't have immigration reform is that age-old question of race. We as a nation do not want to uh, confront our legacy of racism. And what underpins the fight for immigration reform really to me has to do with race. Because when you think about immigrants and you think about the stereotype of immigrants, it's always brown Mexicans, right? And there was a member of Congress, I'll give you a quick anecdote, that recently met, I was uh, with young people a few months ago in Congress engaged, engaging in arrestable actions, let me put it that way. And we came across a group of um, an organization, um, Irish American organization, they all had immig uh, pro-immigration t-shirts and they stopped to talk to us. And during that day, they met, they were lobbying, they met with members of Congress, and one member of Congress openly said to this group, look, if it was just you guys, we wouldn't have a problem. We would have had immigration reform a long time ago, but that's not the issue, right? We know what that means, that's, that's, that's a code for race. Um, but what I would say is that the, uh, the, the final thing I'll say is, we do have public opinion on our side, um, and Carlos is right, it really depends on ultimately with these public opinion polls how you ask the questions, but poll after poll over the last two years have shown that the overwhelming number of Americans now support immigration reform with a path to citizenship. What's really holding things up um, uh, are our members of Congress. It's just my last question before we go, go to the f uh, floor. So IDs, municipal, and state driver's license and an in-state tuition seem to have been the two most important policy areas over the last decade. What do you see going forward uh, as being some of the most important policy areas at the local or state level in terms of what people are pushing for or targeting, but specifically at those levels that those levels can actually address or produce policy on? Oh, since I have the mic, I'll just answer it really quickly and turn it over to you guys. I would say two things. One is it's really important for communities to keep fighting back against law enforcement, right? Every day, 1,100 people are deported in this country, and we now have 2 million people who've been deported under the Obama administration. And these are deportations that lead to the destruction of families. I mean, I spent the last two days, the seven young people who got arrested yesterday, ages 11 to 17, uh, agreed to get arrested because all of them have parents who are either in deportation proceedings or who have already been deported. And they are a microcosm of the four million kids who have undocumented parents and the thousands of kids who have had um, families separated because of our broken immigration system. So I think it's important to keep fighting back against secure communities and to keep fighting back against deportations. But the other thing is I do think it's important to affirmatively push for initiatives that make sense at the local level, that not just make life easier for, Im uh, for immigrants, but create thriving, thriving communities. I, I mean, I think the, the trend which we've seen really just explode literally over the last week, two weeks, three weeks, uh, around uh, limiting cooperation between uh, local enforcement and immigration enforcement, I think that that that's that's that that to me is it, that's that's the future. Um, back in two thousand and eight, two thousand nine, started the Bush starting with the Bush administration. There was this rollout of a program called Secure Communities. Now, what Secure Communities does is you know somebody come you anybody gets booked in a jail or gets booked at the station, uh, their fingerprints are taken. Um, normally, what happens is those fingerprints are taken to the FBI. Police officer gets sort of who, who's there. The police station gets uh, some sort of readout saying, you know, this person's got a warrant. This person, you know, this is what their criminal history looks like. Starting 2008, in addition to that information going to the FBI, in addition to the fingerprints going to the FBI, they're additionally going to DHS, right? So if you're booked at a station, your prints are not only going to go to to the FBI, they're also going to the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security is making an assessment as to whether you're deportable. Are you an immigrant who's here without immigration status? or are you here with immigration status and then the crime that you're accused of makes you deportable. Now, that is a really dangerous form of information sharing and it's had huge impacts around the community, right? People getting pulled over because of, you know, broken taillights, right? We're now being, you know, being not only book, you know, getting uh, you know, criminally prosecuted for that, 
but they were additionally getting deported because of it. So traffic violations have become sort of this, this mechanism for funneling you know, immigrants into, into the deportation machine. Now, what we've seen over the past, I guess starting in 2012 and really just exploding in the last couple of months, is states saying, no, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna break up our families um, you know, because of the Secure Communities Program. You know, just because somebody, you know, commits a minor offense or just because our local police encounter somebody doesn't mean we have to turn them over uh, to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And, you know, you know, literally county after county, you know, in, in, in Oregon, as we speak, in Colorado, in Washington, are making decisions as we speak about, about whether to, 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 to stop participating with, uh, with federal uh, immigration enforcement. And I think right now, um, one of my colleagues just, just did some math today, 45%, 45 of immigrants uh, live in a jurisdiction that's opted out of this sort of cooperation. Now, think about it, that's a huge, huge, huge proportion of, uh, of immigrants that are not going to be, you know, subject to this sort of, uh, you know, to, to, to this sort of risk of separation. Yeah. Great, so let's open it up. Yeah. Well, steal the mic, but um, just a, a, a quick question for you on, on secure communities, Kamal. Um, what's been the administration's response to this wellspring of opposition, or this uh, wellspring of opposition to cooperating with secure communities by these um, local jurisdictions? They are trying to figure that out. Um, it is, it is, I'm sure it's very complicated for them because each jurisdiction is creating its own rules about the circumstances in which it will cooperate and the circumstances that it, in which it will not cooperate. Uh, we do know that as part of Secretary Johnson's review, let me step back a second, a couple months back, President Obama uh, at a meeting with advocates announced that uh, the Department of Homeland Security Se Secretary will be undertaking uh, a review of the country's deportation policies to make sure they're quote unquote humane, right? They're trying to figure out a way to humanely deport people. Um, and as part of that review, we know the administration is looking at ways to tweak the way they handle detainers. We don't know quite what that means. Uh, does that mean they're only gonna issue, maybe I should explain what detainers are. Uh, detainers are basically, to just a step back, they're sort of the mechanism through which uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, holds people. So the way it works is a uh, police officer uh, encounters somebody they believe to be undocumented. Somehow that information gets over to ICE. ICE can't be there instantaneously, right? They don't have the resource to do that. So what they do is they uh, send a form. It's a simple, I think, one or two page form saying, we believe this person you know, is undocumented. We want you to hold them for 48 hours, up to 48 hours until we show up. Major constitutional issues there, right? People are being held not because of a criminal offense or, I mean, you know, not because of, of conduct that they committed, but based on suspicion that they might, you know, they're losing their liberty because of suspicion that they may not be in the country uh, legally. So, um, so we know that they're looking at how they're issuing detainers, right, which is sort of the mechanism through which some of this, um, uh, some of this interaction between Im local police and immigration, uh, immigration enforcement happens. So they're, they're, they're definitely looking at that. Uh, there might be greater use of judicial warrants. Obviously, uh, that would be less constitutionally problematic, but it would also uh, be much more time, you know, costly, right, for the government. And I don't know if they would go there. So this is something that they're very much, uh, I'm sure, trying to figure out uh, how to deal with. Our position is there really shouldn't be, the, the, the Secure Communities Program shouldn't exist, right? There shouldn't be this cooperation between local police and immigration enforcement. When I was talking actually to uh, Chief Burbank, who's the ch police chief from the Salt Lake City uh, Police Department just last week, and one of the things he said is, t if, 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 if people in my community, right, see me as immigration and customs enforcement, right, if they see me as an extension of, of, of the federal government, they're gonna stop talking to me, right? People who are victimized by crimes, right? People who are themselves crime victims whether they're undocumented or whether they're citizens, right? Because people who are citizens have family members who are undocumented, right? We have 11 million mixed status households in this country. I'm not gonna have a relationship with, with the Hispanic community in Salt Lake City if they think I'm an extension somehow of the federal government. So, uh, so our position is there shouldn't be ever any collaboration between 
local police uh, and immigration enforcement. The two should be separate. You know, there are good public safety reasons for doing it. There are good fiscal reasons for doing it from uh, uh, the state and local government's perspective. Uh, and you know, and I, and I think that also just eliminates a lot of these constitutional issues that we see crop up whenever we see those two systems uh, entangle. Muriel? Hi, thank you very much. Um, this is fascinating what, what you're sharing here. I, I come from Europe, from France, which is very famous for uh, Le Front National, Marine Le Pen, and being scared of uh, foreigners. Although I think we have a term for what you just described, uh, Kamal, which is double pen, double penalty. Uh, punishing someone for being a foreigner <laughs> and for doing an offense. And I think we have good people who fight against that. Um, so uh, my question comes from my ignorance of the situation which I'm discovering here. I would like to have more precisions on those um, processes that allow more integration of uh, undocumented um, migrants, such as the local IDs, the state tuition uh, laws or driving license for undocumented um, uh, migrants because that in France seems surreal. Uh, people who don't have papers in France just have to fight for their legal existence. They are put into camps. They, they also organize themselves, but <coughs> it seems totally unthinkable in France, the patriot of human rights, to, um, to have those economic facilities that make your life uh, easier. And for me, it's a great model. It's great to hear that because that's my suspicion that to be cosmopolitan, we need to start very pragmatically at the economic level, at the level of cities. Um, so I'm curious about that because when I go back to France, I want to be able to say, look what they are doing. That's really cosmopolitan. And you're not being true to universal ideals when you're refusing uh, rights on, on behalf of nationality or citizenship that is really linked to a homogeneous community. So I'm very curious, I know little, and I think for Europeans, you know, we are a very, very populistic, afraid continent these days because of uh, the economic crisis as well. And so you did not address the economic aspect of your integration. I think that's important as well. So if you could just comment on that, I would be very grateful, thanks. So I think, um, I would say two things, maybe three things. Um, one is that there is this uh, thing that immigration is a new thing. So I think if we understand immigration to be a new phenomenon, then blah, 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 then we are not gonna understand why immigration happens in the first place. So immigration, at least the historical and there in this country and also in Europe, actually in Europe is much more of a colonial understanding of migration, right? That suddenly my country became independent, but I'm in Paris and now I am not French anymore because I'm not part of the, co so there's a whole dyna colonial dynamic. Here in the US, I think the history has been a very labor, labor um, both, you know, and Kiko was talking about the context of race and slavery, which was talking about race, but I'll add slavery to this equation, is that immigration statuses in this country had been created to really keep a good workflow happening in the country. Chinese come in, uh, m many Mexican workers come in, there's a Bracero program, you come in when we don't have workers, we kick you out when we don't need you. There's a whole dynamic, right? And, and, and I think economically, the government and many of the industries understand this very clearly. Um, so I actually think that uh, what happens, or maybe to talk about economically, is that we're not ever gonna solve the issue of immigration unless we have more equity economically. I mean, that's just probably the core of it. And I think we're gonna be in this struggle for, I mean, I don't know, I don't know when it's gonna end. I don't see an any ending in any time soon. I mean, and soon I mean 100 or 200 years. That's as long as the nation states keep going the way. So to me, I think um, that is gonna be the problem because the problem is really between capital and borders. I mean, that's the core of it. And that's what I have seen in, in, in Paris, in France. Uh, that's what I've seen in, I mean, it's the same dynamic. I think, <sighs> The, the issue, can we make everyone a citizen? And if everyone becomes a citizen in, of this country as sort of is now, then you know, we'll, I know we have a next wave of undocumented people in the next 10 years and we'll deal with the same problems. So I really do not have a great answer to you around the economics of it. Uh, and we can maybe have another economical conversation another time. But that's the, that's the, that's the source of this problem. It's an economic uh, problem of why through the policies of NAFTA in 1994, many uh, Mexican workers come to this country, this place out of their countries to come and find work, and of course a lot of industries benefit from that, so, yeah. 
Uh, let me just quickly add, in terms of your question about how it is that we've been able to move forward a pro-immigrant agenda, I do think it is important to note the history of the way that um, social justice movements in this country have advanced um, rights for people um, from abolitionists to suffragettes to uh, African Americans advancing the civil rights agenda. And the latest iteration of a movement uh, and uh, the uh, gay and lesbian community advancing marriage equality, one of the, the, the biggest movements now around social justice is advancing immigrant rights. And I think the three of us have taken a stab at really looking at the evolution of the immigrant rights movement and what we've been able to advance and what the challenges are. But we, I, I think we lift, uh, we lift from history in terms of social justice movements to figure out ways to advance the cause, the ways to influence elites, ways to capture the hearts and minds of Americans. And we were having a conversation earlier around immigration, and I, I think what's left for us, and I think the Dreamers did a really good job of doing it, but I think we need to continue to do it with um, uh, uh, immigrants who are not documented and, and young people who want permanent status is we have to force a moral confrontation in this country that we have not yet forced around immigration. And I think when we do that, we will accomplish a sense of, of, of history. But I do think th our history of social justice movements really makes a difference in terms of moving these agendas forward. So l let me just add one more dimension to this, getting at the question of how some of these uh, state initiatives were won. I think this, it's, it's mostly driven by a lot of the stuff that we've, we've been talking about, but I do think there is an, um, one contributor has been this making of the policy case behind some of these, uh, behind some of these initiatives. So for example, in-state tuition, right? It costs the state money to, you know, the argument from the other side is it costs the state money to charge undocumented individuals lower tuition um, for to go into the state colleges. The case has been developed through, you know, various state fiscal groups that actually states get a pretty good return on investment from that, right? You know, the, there, there's, there's a tax collection on the other end. We're not just taking somebody and giving them in-state tuition. They become a member of the community, their earnings go up, and so on, right? Driver's licenses, you know, the public safety case for why you should have driver's license, you know, universal driver's licenses has been made pretty strongly, right? Um, um, uh, in terms of this entanglement of local enforcement and, and immigration enforcement, studies have been done to show that there is a serious opportunity cost in having local police, first of all, there's, an, there's a serious absolute cost in having local police investigate immigration status, but there's also a serious opportunity cost in having them do that, right? There was a really deep study done uh, in, uh, of Maricopa County uh, in, in Arizona, which is sort of the textbook example of where immigration, you know, how can immigration enforcement, where immigration enforcement can, can go too far. And what the study found is during a five-year period, when um, immigration enforcement was, was really ramped up in the county, and where the county's budget uh, grew at four times the population growth rate, right? So this is not a lack of money that's happening here. Um, all indicators of public safety went down, right? The homicide rate went up at the county level, even though within the major cities in that county, the homicide rate went down. The um, number of warrants issued went down. The number of cases closed went down. So that sort of analysis, right, making the public policy case for, 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 these, uh, you know, for these policies has been, I, I don't think it's the number one factor, but it's been really key in, in moving you know, certain moderates and Republicans who are on the fence on some of these issues. Maybe last question, Jason. Do we have? Yeah. I can't see the clock. Oh, two. Yeah. Okay. So this is a kind of a broad, a general question for for all three of you. Um, as you're, as I'm sure you're aware, there was uh, immigration amnesty was was accomplished in 1986 under President Reagan, at a time when there was actually very little, uh, well, not very little public support, but less certainly less public support for amnesty. Um, and yet, at this point in time, where there's a lot more support for amnesty. In fact, recent polls show about 70% of Americans are in support of some form of amnesty. Um, it seems like uh, it's some kind of impossible task to get uh, an Im immigration amnesty bill passed. And I was just wondering, what do you think the special challenges are today 
that might not exist uh, have existed back then that are preventing um, this kind of legislation from moving forward. Uh, hi, my name is Isaac Lara. I'm a joint degree uh, candidate between Columbia Law School and Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, also an immigrant, uh, of child of immigrants from Pakistan and from Bolivia. Um, uh, <laughs> I usually get that reaction. <laughs> uh, so uh, my question is, uh, I think it's fairly common for uh, folks to kind of um, point the, the finger at, at Republicans in Congress and attribute the failure of immigration reform to them. However, I also think it's uh, illustrative and reflective of the inability of, of organizations such as yours to actually exert influence on Republicans in Congress. So I'm curious, to what extent have your organizations uh, partnered with um, uh, trade associations, uh, business groups that Republicans will actually listen to? Because those are the kinds of groups that are bankrolling their campaigns and bankrolling these candidates. Thank you. Uh, and specifically, I have in mind like things like Forward US or uh, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Congress, uh, con uh, Commerce. I will be very quick with your first one. I think we have a hopelessly broken Congress, right? We have um, uh, a Congress that has uh, a record for passing the fewest number of legislative bills, um, which I think is a disgrace. I think the number is at 19. Um, and uh, we have uh, a president who is also unwilling to flex his political muscle and wield the kinds of threats that he needs to wield to members of Congress to say, if you don't move on legislation, I'm going to move forward with executive action. To your question, um, there was a time, so after the failure of 2006 and 2007, um, the congressional failure to move forward on legislation, which Carlos talked about earlier, the immigrant rights movement, um, uh, national organization and leaders got together and engaged in a post-mortem of what were their failures. And amongst the things that they recognized as a failure was a lack of what, exactly what you talked about, a lack of influence um, of uh, uh, more conservative, people who fell on the more conservative spectrum. Uh, we would, were all, all of our organizations would have been considered uh, progressive or, or left of center or far left. And so an organization called the National Immigration Forum then took on that responsibility, and they have created something called Bibles, Badges, and Business. And their entire input into this uh, effort to move the agenda forward has been to engage um, business leaders, including the Chamber of Com Commerce, which have done tremendously successful um, uh, conservative faith-based leaders. So they've done this incredible job of mobilizing evangelicals across the country as well as law enforcement officers. So uh, they are really um, organizing in very effective ways the more conservative um, uh, people along the immigration spectrum. And one of the things that I like to say, which is true, is this is the one issue that I think that is outstanding where there is now actually bipartisan agreement on, on the need to pass immigration reform. What is holding this hostage is the Tea Party. So the extreme right wing of the Republican Party is to blame for, um, for the lack of movement on, in Congress. But just this week, um, uh, the National Immigration Forum brought in these evangelicals who are now threatening civil disobedience themselves. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce has organized business so that, I don't know if you saw the article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, where um, growers around the country, including Washington State and California, are threatening to withhold campaign contributions for Republicans if they don't move forward on reform. So I think your critique would have been a really fair and correct one a couple of years ago, but that is no longer, no longer the case. Do they need to ramp it up as fiercely as more progressive organizations are? I would say yes, but then again, I'm biased. Yeah, so I think I'm going to try to answer both your questions with the same answer. I'm going to try to be efficient here. Um, I think I think it was just you know it, it's exactly what Kika said. I mean I think you have a I don't know what the number is 20, 30, 40 members in the House of Representatives who are holding not just immigration reform but lots of other issues hostage. Right? You know there are all the 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 the, the, the speaker sort of continuously announces this so-called Hassert rule, right? I'm not going to move on in a bill without the majority of my caucus, right? I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hand over, I'm not going to pass Democratic Party's policy with like a handful of my members, right? I'm only going to move forward with any legislation that has the majority support of my party. Um, but he's had to break it multiple times, right? To, to get work done, to get legislation passed, 
he's had to basically put together a coalition of a subset of his members and then a large chunk of Democrats. So we have, you know, and I don't know what the number is, 20, 30, 40, members, uh, you know, a lot of them Tea Party types who are holding immigration reform and lots of other legislation hostage. And I don't know how to, and I don't know if the chamber knows how to break them. I don't know if forward.us knows how to break them. I don't know who, who can, you know, can get to them at this point. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know a lot of things as, as, as you can see. Um, I think what I would say is that it's very exciting what's happening in the immigrant rights movement. I will say two things. One, there's very exciting happening in the immigrant rights movement in the US. Uh, I think there's tons of people engaged, there's tons of leaders, there's tons of new policies happening. I think there's a lot of creativity and I think people really feel that this is the battle of our lives. Um, at least that's how I feel about it, that this is not just some campaign that I'm doing. This is something that at least I think my peers and myself we see as the battle of our lives, the battle for the recognition that we are also belong in this country and also are part of our, 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 our nations of origin. I think what gets me excited every morning is that I've been able to see those moments when we have the support, because I think we have increased support, but when that popular, the act, the uh, public opinion becomes popular, and people put their opinions on their feet, and they go and march, and they go and do what is necessary. And I think that there is a moment because of the anti-immigrant policies that it's happening right now. I can feel it is getting very ripe, that people are gonna say enough is enough. And I feel it's gonna happen very soon and, and they're not gonna care who party gets to blame. Everybody's gonna get the beat up because you know, the, the Republicans are to blame, but to me the Democrats are getting away with murder. That's just the way that I see it, you know? And uh, to me, that is what we need. We need 2006 again. We need 40 million people on the streets. We need 20% of more Latinos to get out of the, the Republican party. So those Republicans will be like, oh my God, I have to do something. So, and you know, and, and to me that's my hope, and my hope that just doesn't happen here in the US, but it happens in Europe as well, that it happens in other areas of the world. Um, and that we can for sure now affirm that if you're an immigrant, either if you get with papers or without them, that you have a place in any country across the world. I think that's the vision that we want, but it's not gonna happen unless we turn our opinions into action, that that's my thing. And I think we can, I think we finally have the organizations the, the, the ecosystem of our movement to produce millions of people on the streets. I think it's just a matter of us making some of those decisions. That was a nice high note to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much.